Good evening, and thank you for joining us for SAM's webinar series, uh, Clinical Update Course, The Role of Anticoagulation in COVID-19 Management. It's my pleasure to introduce you to Victoria Fouad as well. Uh, thanks, Lara, um, uh, for uh, moderating, the digital monitor, moderating today. Uh, this is part of our course that we do in SAMS to cover uh, the updates in COVID-19 management. We did the critical care, the cardiology, um, today the anticoagulation. We will be, uh, at this time, um, I could be introducing Dr. Abdulghani Hamadi, who gonna, he is uh, going to be moderating with the uh, speakers. Dr. Abdulghani Hamadi, he is pulmonary critical care, chief of pulmonary section and advocate Christ Medical Center. He is associate professor of medicine at the University of Illinois at Chicago. Uh, Welcome, Dr. Abdul Ghani. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Fuad, and uh, welcome, everyone. This is, again, uh, what Fuad mentioned, is uh, one of a series of, of uh, webinar, educational webinars. And we're happy to have uh, the uh, two speakers uh, today, along with uh, also Dr. Basil Atassi, who will be joining as a third uh, panelist. So first speaker is no stranger to us, Dr. Mazin Khairallah. Uh, Mazin is, uh, as you know, in a unique position uh, for this uh, pandemic. Did you know there will be pandemic uh, coming, Mazin? So you uh, did uh, both infectious disease and critical care? Yeah, I waited 25 years for that. Exactly, I, I <laughs> thought so. So uh, uh, it's a unique uh, combination, uh, but it's perfectly fitting now. So he is... Um, uh, boarded in both, uh, obviously, in internal medicine, critical care, and infectious disease. He is an assistant uh, associate professor, University of North Dakota, and he is the medical director of the critical care services. He has done, and he, he gave us multiple presentations before uh, about COVID, and um, he's done multiple webinars. So we welcome uh, Mazin again, and uh, uh, take it away. Okay, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Uh, thank you very much uh, for the invitation. Uh, as you see, I made the title COVID-19, a thromboinflammatory disease. I think this is more descriptive of what we are dealing with in this disease. We're getting more and more evidence that this is a thromboinflammatory disease. So in fact, probably uh, Basil would fit into this more than infectious disease and critical care. It would actually, from what we learned about this disease, it looks like the predominant presentation for those patients is thrombosis. What I will try to do is I will <clears throat> first go through the timeline, how we learned about this disease, how the uh, evidence evolved, and then I will put some strategies, then open it up for uh, the other panelists, uh, Dr. Basil and Dr. Fuad, to share their experience with us, and we allow enough time for questions and answers started by the end of uh, December on January 6. In New York Times, we learned about uh, that China grapples with mystery pneumonia-like illness. <coughs> and in the Lancet by January 24th, we got the first description of uh, these pneumonias in a family cluster uh, in China. The same uh, issue on January 24th, we had clinical features of uh, cohort patients with uh, pneumonia secondary to COVID-19. In this cohort study, we, this is the first day where we learned that those patients have increased D-dimer especially if they are admitted to the intensive care unit. The uh, median uh, D-dimer level was, the uh, average, uh, average D-dimer level was 2.4 compared to 0.5 for the non-ICU patients. 
We also learned that thrombocytopenia is not a major presentation feature of the coagulopathy associated with this disease. February 18th, we learned that uh, those patients with abnormal coagulation parameters are associated with poor prognosis. And we also learned that those patients have, if they did not survive, they would have more likely to have increased D-dimers, increased fibrillation split products, and slight prolongation in the PT. And this is from the Chinese study. <clears throat> in the Lancet or on March 6th, another uh, retrospective uh, Chinese uh, study looking at risk factors for mortality of adult patients. Those patients who did not survive had much higher D-dimer levels compared to patients who survived. March 20th, the uh, International Society of Thrombosis and Hemostasis convened and came up with guidance on recognition and management of coagulopathy in COVID-19. April 6, we started getting some data about autopsies. And this is a preprint, not published yet, but this is from New Orleans in the United States, long sec sections showing thrombi within small vessels. There was thrombotic microangiopathy, which was restricted to the lungs in their pathology reports. April 13th, a big study <clears throat> from the Netherlands in published in thrombosis research, and this is by Clock al showed that 31% of patients would develop thrombotic complications in the intensive care unit. 81% of this thrombotic complications were in the form of pulmonary embolism. At the time of publication, they followed those patients up to 10 days. Just a few days ago, they uh, published another update on their study where they followed those patients up to till 22 days. They had a total of 184 patients. They had 65 PEs, five ischemic strokes, and two arterial emboli. You can see that the rate of thromboembolic complications gets to up to 60%. <clears throat> On April 23rd, New England of Medicine described antiphospholipid antibodies in three patients with significant coagulopathy. And those patients had multiple infarcts, including CVAs and limb arterial clots. And this, the descriptions of these three patients that were described in that case series study. May 4th, four French ICUs published a very nice uh, uh, multicenter prospective cohort study looking at thrombotic complications. They found 42% of patients had thrombotic complications. They experienced circuit clottings in patients with CRRT, almost 97% of CRRT circuits clotted and less though on ECMO circuits. They observed high D-dimer in more than 95% of cases also had high fibrinogen. Of note, those features are not specific for DIC because they lack thrombocytopenia in most of the cases and the fibrinogen level was high. So it is not a DIC picture, it's a coagulation abnormality associated with this infection. And they also described 88% of patients had lupus anticoagulants. On May, on May 5, 
<clears throat> another study in the, in the New England Journal of Medicine where they described also seeing lupus anticoagulant in 18% of patients with COVID-19. On May 6, autopsy findings and venous thromboembolism in patients with COVID-19, DVT was described in 7 out of 12 patients, a rate of 58, <clears throat> and 4 patients with pulmonary embolism. So on the right side here, the DVT, and on the left side, it's the pulmonary embolism. This is in the Annals of Internal Medicine. May 14th, large vessel stroke. Five cases in New England Journal of Medicine described CVAs with, associated with COVID-19. Just today though, a big study from, a good study from Germany about autopsy results of seven COVID patients compared to other uh, seven COVID, seven uh, influenza patients showed severe endothelial injury associated with intravascular SARS-CoV-2 virus. They saw the virus inside the endothelial cells, intra intracellular. And they also described disrupted endothelial cell membranes. There was vascular thrombosis with microangiopathy and occlusion of alveolar capillaries. There was significant new vessel growth through a mechanism of what they called intersustentive angiogenesis. And you can see here the thrombi inside the vessels. And this is higher magnification with thrombi inside the vessels. In summary of uh, this timeline, what we're dealing with is, is a disease that is associated with coagulation abnormality abnormalities with increased D-dimer, increased fibrinogen, slight prolongation of PT, BTT, or INR, and INR, and not much of thrombocytopenia. There was a high rate of lupus anticoagulants and the reported cases of antiphospholipid antibodies. There, there are micro and macro thrombosis cases, and the thrombosis is involving arterial and venous systems. Clinical uh, studies describe this, included pulmonary embolism, DVTs, CBAs, clotting CRTs, and ECMO circuits. In a nice webinar by Dr. Uh, Flamenhardt, described first time what they thought it is happening in those patients uh, of endotheliitis. And there's a, a mechanism of disruption of this endothelial cells that the essential function of it is to keep the surface anticoagulated through different mechanisms that I'm not going to go into details. And in fact, I don't understand most, most of those mechanisms myself. However, the endothelial cells have functions, antiplatelet functions, they have anticoagulant receptors, and they have cytoprotective signaling. And with the injury caused by the virus on the lung, there's hypoxia or hypoxemia, cell death, protease release, and leukocyte activation. All this will interact with, the, with these mechanisms and cause loss of anticoagulant surface. This will lead to fibrin formation. There's also von Willebrand factor release, leukocyte recruitment and complement activation. All this together will work towards having more of thrombosis and that's why we call this disease thromboinflammatory disease. And this is the study that was published today where it showed pulmonary vascular endotheliitis, thrombosis, and angiogenesis in COVID-19. They do have a very nice electron microscopy images, where on the, in, in the A panel here, you see a normal endothelial cells. You can see the disrupted cells in this on the right side here. 
in this area here you see you see the angiogenesis and they have a pillar here in the middle where angiogen angiogenesis is happening around it and here in this panel here you see the virus inside the cell and this is a bigger magnification where you see the virus itself inside the endothelial cells so do we have any evidence for anticoagulation what we can talk about is probably two major studies and both both uh, of these studies are limited in terms of uh, multiple uh, factors the first one is a chinese study that looked at as a positive study and we're going to look into it in details and the second one is just published uh, on may 6th uh, it's an american study in new york area that is also showed positive results so the first one is uh, by tang et al published at the journal of thrombosis and hemostasis looking at anticoagulant treatment that is associated with decreased mortality in severe COVID-19 patients. And what they use in this study is sepsis-induced coagulopathy score. And they just wanted to describe this very quickly. It is dependent on platelets count, PTINR, SOFA score. And then you, they assign scores for values of platelets, PT and the SOFA score. Come up with a score. If it is four and above, it is a score associated with sepsis-induced coagulopathy. So when they looked at their patients, 449 patients with COVID-19, again, it is retrospective study. And they looked at 28-day mortality. By the way, we know now that 28-day mortality may not be an appropriate measure for those patients. Those patients stay with us in the intensive care unit on, for a long time, 23 days on average, but some of those, those patients stayed with us for four to five weeks so far. <clears throat> so when they looked at those patients who received heparin, and again, those or uh, to mention that this heparin was used as prophylaxis. In China, they do not administer uh, anticoagulation prophylaxis routinely on their patients because of genetic predisposition. When they looked at patients with sepsis-induced coagulopathy score more than, more than five or five, total number of patients, I'm sorry, four or more than uh, four, total number of patients, 97, mortality rate was 40% in the heparin group, compared to 64% in the no heparin group, with the statistical significance p-value. For those patients with, less, with a score less than four, the difference in mortality was not significant. And D-dimers more than six times upper normal limit in 34 patients only, mortality rate was 33% compared to 52% with statistical significance. So it looks like the, there's an association with improved mortality and inflammatory marker mainly the D-dimer, if it is more than six times above upper limit, or if you use sepsis-induced coagulopathy score. And this, this is just to show, show it again, with a sepsis-induced uh, coagulopathy score, difference in mortality, similarly with the D-dimer above six times uh, upper normal limit, there's an improved mortality. The second study that is available is from New York Data Association of Treatment Dose Anticoagulation with in-hospital survival among hospitalized patients with COVID-19, published on May 6, 2020. When they looked at all patients and they had a total of 2,773 patients, and this is retrospective study again. When they looked at all patients, there was no difference in terms of mortality. However, when they looked at those patients who were mechanically ventilated, they saw a difference in mortality that was statistically significant. 
So the anticoagulation group in all patients mortality rate was 22.5%. No anticoagulation group mortality rate was 22.8%. However, when, you look, when they looked at mechanically ventilated patients, total of 495 patients, mortality rate was 29% versus 63%. Now, there, there are some, uh, some limitations for this study. Number one, patients who receive therapeutic anticoagulation were more likely to require invasive mechanical ventilation. And there was a statistically significant uh, difference between the two, 30% versus 8%. The group of no anticoagulation has unusual high mortality rate into it compared to other patients that we, uh, we see. So 63% is actually very high mortality rate now compared to what we see on average is in all ICUs, 50% mortality rate. Our mortality rate is actually now so far is 16% in our ICU. The other thing that there's indication bias. This is a retrospective study, observational study. So physicians were selecting which patients would need anticoagulation. And that would be most of the time based on indication. So that was, would put us actually into indication bias that may, may alter the, the, the result of this study. And the last thing is actually there's immortal time bias where those patients who died before they uh, get anticoagulation would actually go into the no anticoagulation. So if somebody got admitted within hours, died in the hospital, that way patient would be looked at uh, if he did not receive anticoagulation. And that's why I probably can explain why the mortality rate is a little bit higher uh, in no anticoagulation uh, study compared to our bra, uh, in no anticoagulation group compared to our bra, uh, average uh, mortality rate in the ICU. So that takes us actually into <clears throat> different strategies that were accommodated by different centers. And we want to hear from our uh, panelists what they do in their, uh, in their uh, center. Uh, however, these strategies uh, varied from uh, uh, just stick to full anticoagulation only if we confirm uh, venous uh, thrombo uh, thromboembolic uh, phenomena. And this is not different than what we do in normal condition outside COVID. However, based on what we have observed, most of the institutions accommodated intermediate dose prophylaxis. Again, those complications occurred despite the fact that all those patients were anticoagulated with prophylaxis other than the Chinese data. So that's why we started using higher dose anticoagulation for those patients. And some uh, centers uh, opted for risk adjusted full anticoagulation based on certain criteria that we will hear from uh, Ziad and uh, Basil uh, Abdelani again uh, short, very shortly. Very few centers uh, decided to do full anticoagulation for all patients, only if there's no contraindication to anticoagulation. With this, I would like to uh, transition to the protocols that different centers have uh, accommodated and uh, We'll send it back to you, Abdelani. Okay, thank you very much, Mazin. Um, appreciate your presentation. So now we move on to Dr. Ziad. Dr. Ziad uh, Kafri, he's a hematologist, oncologist, and he's the director of the fellowship program at uh, Ascension St. John Hospital, and he's an assistant professor of medicine at Wayne State University in uh, one of the hot areas, Detroit, right? Mm -hmm. Right. right. Thanks. So, uh, Thanks for inviting me. Assalamu alaikum. And uh, right. hopefully I will carry on with Dr. Khairallah's presentation. I'm trying to share. I have just one slide to go over with you. Um, uh, seems like uh, is disabled. If you can let me share the screen. Mm. Who disabled it? The host disabled it. I don't know who. Lara? Oh, okay. Try it again now.
Are you able to share it? Um, trying. Are you still having trouble? Yeah. Maybe an issue with my desktop. Okay. In the meantime, uh, uh, Mazen, the death rates that in the New York study is all over. It's not just the ICU, the hospitalized, the non-mechanical ventilation, all really high um, mortality rate. Um, did you kind of have any comment on this from like, is there different population they included in these studies? I mean, how come they have that high, uh, ex extremely high uh, above 50%? Well, we certainly have observed differences in mortality rates among different states. And uh, I, I cannot think of anything other than resources available uh, during the surge that occurred uh, in New York area. I can tell you that here we can see that uh, Ziad was able to share his slides, but uh, so I make it sh uh, short. I can tell you that mortality rate in Chicago in the hospital I'm working at was close to 15%. I'm talking about ICU mortality rates, by the way. Okay, yeah. And compared to 16% at University of North Dakota. And the only difference uh, I can see uh, between these two places, nursing ratio. We had very difficult time actually getting nurses to care for our patients. And at, in Chicago, four to five patients for one nurse. That was too much actually. We have experienced so many complications associated with the care for those patients. I'm not sure if the same thing happened also in New York during the surge, but people uh, went out and uh, talked about how resources were not were not available. Okay, uh, can you see my screen? Yeah, we can see it. Oh, okay, great. Okay, so. Um, so obviously carrying on with uh, Dr. Khairullah's presentation, we adopted in our institution um, the risk adoptive uh, uh, categories. And obviously, you know, sometimes you may tell if the patient considered at low risk versus high risk compared to the setting of the patient. So those patients start from pri probably an urgent care or with their primary care physician with mild to moderate symptoms going into the emergency room. Some of these patients may get admitted to the hospital. Some, some patients may go home. And then when they are admitted to the hospital, some patients may have mild illness um, and wouldn't require, for example, you know, support with uh, invasive mechanical ventilation or even hemodialysis or uh, pressor support and some patients may need to be transferred to intensive care unit. So looking at these different categories and the numbers that come with individual patients, we decided to go with four categories, what we call low risk here, and I put in green, green to deal with, green to go home, and then like traffic light, low intermediate risk. So those are the higher risk patients, but still ambulatory and minimally symptomatic and only encountered in the emergency room. And then we have the setting of the hospital that we called intermediate risk and uh, mostly intensive care setting that we call high risk. So the, the factors that we looked at here are basically the combination of eligibility criteria or subgroup analysis that we've seen in the study that Dr. Khairallah just went over. And uh, for example, now 80% uh, of the people that died from COVID had D-dimer more than 1,000 and 80% of the people that died from COVID had lymphopenia, which is a sign of severe viral infection. So if you combine these two, for example, you know, probably most of the patients that died from COVID had either high D-dimer or lymphopenia. So if you combine these together, it, it's probably a way to fish these high-risk patients and deal with them a little differently. Now, obviously, you know, we need to uh, examine uh, the strength of, of these recommendations in, in a randomized fashion, or at least in, in a, under a, like a clinical study or intervention in prospective manner. But with the limited um, time that we have and, and, and being in the middle of this crisis, we try to use our best judgment and best practices. So we end up developing this criteria and um, 
can probably zoom in a little bit here. So talking about the stable patients, and this is probably what we're gonna start seeing more of now that the states start opening up and, and more people getting tested that probably asymptomatic or minimally symptomatic. So in case our patient has maybe high d dimer, and here we defined as more than 1,000 and lymphocyte, uh, lymphocytopenia. So um, uh, the lymphocyte count less than 800 or less than 5%. Recent hospitalization for COVID. So these are the patients that came in and discharged and came back again to the ER with some symptoms. History of venous thromboembolism, prior history of PE, for example, and history of these top three diseases that have been explored in, in the Chinese database, diabetes, hypertension, and coronary artery disease, any of these. Active cancer, whether they are on or off chemotherapy, BMI more than 30 or age more than 65. So those are basically stable patients in a community setting, but they have high risk features. So if the answer for these questions is no, that those are the true low risk patients. Now, now when we say low risk patients, most of these patients are gonna go home and be quarantined, uh, obviously maybe laying down in their basement, inactive, which is something wrong to do because that will increase the risk. They are considered at hypercoagulable state. They may not need standard DVT prophylaxis, but they need to stay active as much as possible. And this is what we recommend generically for all the patients that we interfere or uh, take care of. Now, you may wonder, you know, should we prescribe them aspirin? Dr. Khairullah mentioned that 40% of the uh, patients that have COVID develop somehow antiphospholipid antibodies. Unfortunately, this is immune response. Now, whether this antiphospholipid antibody would require viral uh, protein components to be attached to phospholipid membranes or act independently yet to be explored. Unfortunately, you know, when we develop these antibodies, their lifespan is beyond the lifespan of the virus in the blood, which means that you know, thrombotic risk may go beyond four weeks and beyond 30 days. Anyway, so in selected cases, and my ER team asked me, well, Dr. Caffrey, should we screen everyone for antiphospholipid? I said there is, you know, as long as the patient has none of these risk categories and appear to be um, asymptomatic, at least from the venous thromboembolism standpoint, if you want to use risk criteria for wills, whether it's for DVT or PE, there is no reason to prescribe them anything right now or no evidence for us to prescribe any of them. But, you know, if you're worried, you may just prescribe aspirin for about 30 days. Now, for low intermediate risk, those are the patients that are overweight, over the age of 65, have cancer, have history of DVT, maybe diabetes, maybe hypertension, maybe coronary artery disease, high D-dimer, and or lymphopenia. Those patients actually we deal with uh, more seriously, although they are still in the ambulatory setting, we are actually recommending that they receive prophylactic anticoagulation therapy with one of these three choices, and we put them in order. We actually, our preference is for rivaraxaban, 10 milligram PO daily for 30 days. Rivaraxaban, we learned about this uh, direct anticoagulant, antifactor 10A. Uh, it has some antiplatelet activity. And us knowing that uh, those patients may have actually activation of platelets would be ideal to use a drug like rivaraxaban. Now, in case you know we cannot use that drug or we cannot use abaxaban, we go for aspirin. Some people ask me, well, Dr. Caffrey, how we get around this? You know, there is no indication for any of these drugs to be used in this setting. How are we going to dispense these drugs to the patient? So obviously there is a starter kit and that starter kit is for free. The problem with the starter kit does not have rivaraxaban 10, usually has rivaraxaban 15. What we learned about uh, rivaraxaban or Zilorto, for doses above 10, you need to take it with meals to facilitate absorption. So uh, 10 doesn't matter because it's a small dose. So it will be absorbed with meal or without meal. So what we're doing in our institution, we're actually giving them the starter kit if the insurance denied the 10 milligram. And we ask them to take 15 on empty stomach without food. So we're assuming that probably they're not going to absorb the 15. They're going to absorb probably close to 10 milligrams. So these are tricks that we've been doing in our institution and so far actually been going very well with our patients and we're collecting all the information for these patients and we just opened a protocol actually with the IRB to study these cases um, as we move forward. 
So we ask patients also that are going home to stay active as much as possible. Now, moving to the inpatient world, the difficult world that appear to be shrinking right now, the peak in our hospital in the mid of COVID crisis around April 6, uh, we had uh, we test we had a thousand patients tested positive for COVID. Only at one time, 280 get admitted to the hospital. Our mortality rate probably in the range of 50 to 60 percent. Um, Ziad, I see you. Ziad, uh, I just want to remind you of the time. Okay. So if you can. Uh, uh, go a little bit faster because we don't want to run out of time. Yeah, so I need two more minutes. Um, oh. So we selected this high risk criteria and it came from most of the studies that Dr. Khirala mentioned too, like the D-dimer more than 3000, the high six core, a severe organ dysfunction. So those are the floor patients that appear to be crashing and in need for probably uh, pressors or on their way to be intubated. So those actually were moving, if the answer is yes for any of these questions, we're moving them to the high risk category. High risk category means we start patients on full dose anticoagulation therapy. Now, obviously the main one is confirmed acute VTE with a limitation, and that's from my experience. Yes, those patients have D-dimer. Yes, they are sick, but I don't see Doppler order for the lower extremities. And in most cases, I don't even see angio CT scan. So while we're saying they, they have no VTE, well, we didn't test for it. So if these patients are high risk, at least using Will's criteria, we're moving on with uh, full dose anticoagulation therapy for as long as they appear to be in danger. And when they are actually stable or we start running through bleeding complications, we move down back to the prophylactic dose. Now for the intermediate risk patients, so the answer for this question is no. Those are the patients with lower D-dimer or not much of a uh, comorbid conditions. Those are treated with, if you will, intensive uh, prophylactic anticoagulation therapy. And here, as you see, defined as inaxaprin, 30 milligrams sub QQ 12 hours. If they get discharged, we are actually recommending prophylactic anticoagulation treatment like this group for 30 days post discharge. If they are diagnosed with VTE, we're approaching that or treating that as acute provoked VTE. So we're uh, providing them with full dose anticoagulation therapy for 30 days post discharge. If they did not develop VTE, they go with prophylactic anticoagulation for uh, 30 days only. And if we ever screened in any group uh, or detected antiphospholipid antibodies, we put them in addition to that on aspirin. I want to keep in mind that uh, there is risk of bleeding and we did notice actually increased uh, transfusion requirements in our patients, but we didn't lose any, to the best of my knowledge, due to bleeding. Actually, we lost many for thrombosis. But this is just to keep an eye, uh, eye on, on, on that risk, whether they have the people admitted with active bleed, severe anemia defined as hemoglobin less than seven, or requiring more than two units blood transfusion within 48 hours, and history of recurrent bleeding from like small bowel AVMs, acute intracranial hemorrhage detected, overt DIC, platelet count less than 25,000, being on dual antiplatelet therapy, um, those obviously the patients that we uh, uh, dealt with very carefully uh, moving forward with anticoagulation. And uh, this is it. This is our experience. Obviously, it's not, not evidence-based medicine. We've been applying actually uh, these guidelines for the past uh, four to six weeks. And so far, you know, the pharmacy just yesterday shared with me the numbers. And our mortality rate dropped by 20% compared to our historical control means before April 6th. So just by applying this protocol, our inpatient mortality dropped by about from 52% um, to 33% in our hospital. And thank you very much for listening and I'll leave the floor to the rest of the panel. Well, thank you very much, Ziad. Uh, very, very informative and useful. And one of the, I had a question pop up on the chat that can we, can you guys share the slides with uh, uh, with, uh, with, uh, with everybody. Yeah, of course, okay. yeah. Okay, so the answer is yes. The, this okay. slide, I know this is not official, but this slide exists on my Facebook account. So if you search my name, Ziad Kafri on Facebook, you'll find this pathway actually on Facebook. Okay, thank you very much. So next we have uh, Dr. Basil Atassi, hematology oncology. He's a clinical assistant professor of medicine, Chicago Medical School works at OSF Little Company of Mary Hospital. 
And I think, Basil, you have a couple of slides. Yes, a couple of slides. And uh, I would like to thank uh, other panelists, uh, Dr. Khirullah and Dr. Kafri, for the great uh, discussion. Uh, can you see my slide? Yes. We can see, actually. OK, perfect. You know, um, as uh, Dr. Kafri, Dr. Khirala mentioned, that uh, we don't have any uh, standard, but although there's no any. Uh, uh, Basil, your slide disappeared. I know, yeah. I'm just going to come, uh -huh. come, come in sections. Oh, OK. High tech. High tech. So, um, although there's no standard guidelines adopted by any of the societies, um, but we agree on the hematology in, in the critical care and in the infectious disease societies that there is big thrombosis and thrombotic events happen in these, in these patients, causing the major mortality and morbidity in these people, especially the inpatients. So, this is why we adopted all these uh, different uh, institutional criteria as how when we, when we do anticoagulation. And I pretty much liked uh, what Dr. Kefri uh, posted on his Facebook a few weeks ago, and I am almost adopting what he's been doing in my practice too. Um, although, although I said there's no guidelines, and uh, the ASH, ASH is the American Society of Hematology, just finished on May 15, um, uh, uh, finishing collecting nomination for a panel of uh, people who are experts to put the guidelines for us when to do anticoagulation, when not to do anticoagulation. And this is uh, gonna come up soon, which will be probably our new standard coming in the next, uh, hopefully, short period of time. So, um, as uh, they mentioned how the, Dr. Kefri, how he does his anticoagulation, and how, uh, I would like to mention some patients from my own practice. And, uh, and as uh, we've seen, that many people who are benefited from uh, the full dose anticoagulation have to follow the D-dimer, the level of oxygenation, and all these things. But at the same time, this is not uh, like all we see. We see always like challenging cases. For example, uh, a COVID-19 inpatient uh, patient had denied prophylactic anticoagulation. Uh, this is a textbook definition that this patient is very, very high risk. And in, on day six, he developed uh, a DVT and a PE. So be careful and make sure that all patients, regardless, uh, be at least on the uh, anticoagulation prophylactic dose, all the hospitalized patients. Um, now, a COVID patient in the floor I had, and his D-dimer is more than six normal, and his D-dimer was four. Our normal is 0 0.5. So, and he is on low oxygenation requirement. He is on two liters of oxygen. He's doing better, he's going home. Am I going to put him on full dose anticoagulation? I'm not. So be careful about which patient, even with a high lead dimer, which patient you select, can be your, your own judgment and practice. A uh, patient came to the ER with severe chest pain and short of breath. And she went to CT angiogram, and there was a huge uh, pulmonary embolism, or standard emboli. And the dimer was 0 0.7, when normal 0 0.5. This was a COVID-19 positive patient. So again, our clinical judgment precede any certain numbers that we follow like on the uh, different uh, criteria. So make sure that you do your judgment when you, whenever you apply your anticoagulation. Uh, now, our patient, COVID-19 middle-aged patient was diagnosed and uh, he had moderate symptoms. He did not require to be admitted to the hospital and he recovered. After three weeks, he came with loss of sensation, skin discoloration, and in his lower extremities, and there were no pulses. And this patient was found to have huge embolus in his bifurcation of abdominal aorta, causing major peripheral vascular disease and ischemia. So we are seeing, as Dr. Kefri mentioned, we're seeing post-COVID uh, complications of different diseases, including thrombotic events. So, um, Make sure that people who are doing the practice and be careful about bleeding. One of the studies mentioned that bleeding is 3% in COVID-19 patients. These are the major bleeding. Uh, but this could be life-threatening uh, bleeding. So the managing physician has to know how to manage bleeding, how to reverse anticoagulation, how to transfuse, and daily follow up on the patient clinically, uh, his dose of anticoagulation, his hypoxia level, 
is hemoglobin. This is very, very essential for all patients to avoid critical bleeding or, God forbid, mortality from anticoagulation. And some practices have seen mortality uh, from anticoagulation, so just need to be careful. This is something that I advise every practice who do these things to, to do. Uh, Lovenox or even heparin uh, can be monitored by anti-10A level. So this is something very important to know how you are dosing your anticoagulation. Even the prophylactic dose has anti-10 level and the full dose also has anti-10 level to follow. Our own hospital, they have the quick test. We can do the test within one hour and we can accordingly adjust our dose. Lastly, uh, negative venous double ultrasound does not mean there's no blood clots because I ha we have seen some patients, they do ultrasound lower extremities uh, ordered by their physicians. It's negative, that means there's no blood clot. If you have high D dimer, if you have hypoxia, if you have, have clinical judgment high for possible pulmonary embolism, you should do follow the protocol that you do in your hospital that you apply full dose anticoagulation and not rely only on negative uh, venous double ultrasound. The blood clots can develop in the lung, it can develop in the legs, but transfer to the lung with, with negative uh, veins. Uh, so just be careful that not always uh, negative ultrasound means there's no uh, thrombotic events. And I'm ready for any questions. All right, thank you very much, Basil. And uh, I think now we need to open it for questions. I, I just wanna add one thing one unique experience in our, in our hospital. Uh, our hospital, we have probably the largest uh, patients who had ECMO. Uh, they did about 35 ECMOs, which is, or 40, which is about 10% of the ECMOs of the world. They, uh, worldwide, they did 400. And one thing unique about those patients is uh, the surgeons, obviously, they decide, decided to anticoagulate all these patients with argatroban, not heparin. And the reason for that is they uh, had a problem with a flow with heparin. So they just decided to go with argatroban. There is no scientific basis for this. It's not evidence-based. It's what they think uh, should work and what, what, what they think is the best. We've had some complications with bleeding, but no one died actually. Among all these ECMO patients, I think we only had two or three died and many of them have been decannulated and extubated. But it's just a unique experience that I don't know if anybody else has that, and I know there's no scientific basis for that. It's just that uh, um, interesting uh, experience. So that's just for ECMO, like uh, COVID patients, or a general rule for ECMO? No, no, COVID ECMO. Just COVID. Yeah. COVID ECMO. Not, not general. Usually with ECMO, it's a heparin. But these COVID patients, they had a problem with their flow. Well, and, if uh, uh, they just early on decided to go with our gatroban. Yeah, you know, and uh, my pathway, I put actually uh, a accommodated part for HIT. We discovered actually, I would say at least 10, 15% chance of developing HIT antibody in these patients. And just remembering that uh, unfractionated heparin is, uh, has high molecular weight and maybe some of these COVID antibodies are actually working like HIT antibody. Like when you give heparin, they even get attached to the platelets more. So it's probably not a bad idea to use ergatroban. But in general, as a rule, heparin is well known to be working more on, on plastic catheters and artificial surfaces better than ergatroban, a general rule. But this case is probably unique, and maybe it's supported by our observation that about 15% uh, at least of these patients develop HIT antibodies during treatment. So any other questions uh, from, uh, do we have any questions from the audience? We do have a couple of questions, and I want to encourage everybody in the audience who wants to submit a question. You can submit it by clicking on the Q&A box that should be at the bottom of your screen, depending on how you're joining us this evening on Zoom. Uh, if you click on that Q&A, you can submit a question that way, or if you prefer to submit it in the uh, chat box, that's also an option. Um, I will give you the first question that came in. Um, it's uh, any comments on patients admitted to medical floor with BTE, subsegmental PE, and atrial clots in lower limbs. Um, he or she is giving an example of a patient uh, discharged on Eliquis for six months, had a D-dimer of over 10,000, no respiratory symptoms. 
So obviously those patients, and if uh, you kind of zoomed into the autopsy uh, slide of Dr. Khirallah, most of the clots that we see in the lung are actually subsegmental. And this is one of the challenging things for angio CT scan. We don't see actually subsegmental PEs on angio CT, especially if they are diffused. They just hold the contrast in the middle and you just don't see these vessels. I think those patients need still to be treated with full dose anticoagulation therapy and you manage them like provoked VTE for three months. I have a question for you, uh, Ziad. Uh, uh, you put uh, a fixed dose uh, in uh, uh for your intermediate uh, uh, category. Um, is that what you do or you, you do weight-based uh, uh, dosing like 0.5 milligrams of inexoparin uh, per kg? Well, so we have many ways of looking at it, but I didn't mention two other things to just simplify the algorithm. This is for a standard patient less than 120 kilos. If the patient more than 120 kilos, we put them on 40 Q12. Correct, because it's very important that for the uh, audience to know that uh, you know, outside the COVID-19, our obese patients will get higher dose prophylaxis. But the other question is, you know, your preference is inexoparin for those patients? Uh, yes, for multiple reasons. Uh, inexoparin is, uh, um, in general, have like more predictable half-life and predictable action compared to heparin. Um, and, um, you know, with heparin, we have some, in some of these patients, especially if they develop lupus anticoagulants, baseline prolonged PTT. So sometimes you may wonder, you know, are they reaching therapeutic doses with heparin or, um, um, or this is just their baseline prolonged PTT because of lupus anticoagulant, which, falls, which is false prolongation let alone the issue of um, HIT also. Is le there is less chance of experiencing HIT with low molecular weight heparin. So for all the these other, reasons, we favor actually Lubinox. One of the other reasons why we're trying to shy, shy away from heparin, the drip, because you need a lot of titration, uh, need a lot of requirement for the blood draws. The nurse or the phlebotomist has to go to the room, to the COVID-19 patient room, to do the blood draws every two hours, every six hours. So we're trying to one shot of Lubinox or two OBID shots is easier. Correct. Well, there's and a question for you, Basil. Uh, um, from Barbara O'Neill about the patient you mentioned um, uh, who uh, had low oxygen requirement. Shouldn't you have, uh, sh should you put him on aspirin at least? Uh, There's actually a couple of questions, not to interrupt. There's actually a couple of questions around aspirin. So if you want to sort of address the aspirin controversy in general, um, does, it, does it seem to be worthwhile? Is there a benefit to using it versus risk? And does it seem to be lower risk than DOAC? It was the comment from Barbara. I think, uh, Ziad, you mentioned this uh, in your... In your... Okay. So, you know, I can mention it easily. Um, you know, our actually data from my institution is also finding lupus anticoagulant in about 45%, 40-45% of the patient that we screen. We almost screened everyone. Um, so, if we detect antiphospholipid antibodies, we do aspirin. If we don't, we are actually just settling with uh, DOAX. We're not, we're trying to avoid DOAX during hospitalization because of many drug-drug interaction. We start DOAX when patient is ready to go home. Aspirin is only my backup if I cannot use DOAX. Um, aspirin probably been uh, uh, studied multiple times in the past in, in, in many, many studies for the prevention or especially the, the arterial events. And um, we had like multiple studies came back to back in New Grand Journal of Medicine about a year ago about the negative impact of aspirin on the body. So I think, you know, with aspirin, although it sounds like accessible over the counter and it's easy to get, I want to use it with caution. I wouldn't recommend it for every COVID patient if they have antiphospholipid antibodies for sure. If they don't, and I can't do DOAX, I, my last resort, my last backup is to do aspirin because it's still better than nothing. And that's proven in, in clinical studies. For VTE, we're not talking about arterial events specifically, for VTE. The other exception that I have for aspirin, if the patient during that hospitalization had an arterial event, like CVA or like uh, uh, was mentioned, Dr. Latassi mentioned uh, um, ischemic event in the limb, those are also patients that would require aspirin. Uh, 
There was a Thank comment you. about there. Drip. I'm sorry. Go ahead, Laura. I was going to say the same thing. Uh, there is a comment about the heparin drip possibly adding to fluid volume and that potentially being an issue with ARDS. Um, I don't know if you have anything further to comment on that, anybody from the panel. Well, honestly, those heparin bags are not very large. Um, so from my personal experience, and, and Dr. Khairullah probably can co comment on this, we actually have problem with the opposite. I know most of the uh, ICUs use fluid restrictive protocol because of the, the infiltrate that appear in the lung, but there is really no fluid overload to speak of in these patients. And quite often, some of them are even hypotensive. So fluid was not an issue in, in, in my institution, although they were using fluid restrictive protocol, but for heparin drip specifically, if we talk about volume versus uh, Lovenac sub-Q, that was not an issue, at least in our institution. That is uh, correct. Uh, however, let's uh, be careful uh, uh, with uh, fluids uh, because uh, we have seen uh, patients who uh, became uh, 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 with uh, renal impairment uh, associated with uh, hemodynamic instability and they were restricted from fluid. So what we use is uh, as uh, uh, hemodynamic uh, targeted uh, approach uh, based on uh, parameters uh, to resuscitate the patient with uh, the right amount of fluid. Uh, we use uh, uh, the uh, uh, stroke volume variation for those patients who are intubated uh, to uh, address uh, the amount of fluid that they would get. Uh, but in general, if, there is, uh, if the patients are hemodynamically stable, we would like to keep them on the drier side uh, without causing any uh, kidney injury. Right, and the other uh, notion that I want to add for heparin versus Lubinox uh, discussion is some of these patients actually end up with uh, acute renal insufficiency that would require initiation of hemodialysis. When we get to that point, we cannot really, well, it's hard to dose Lubinox. It's easier to just go with heparin. Yeah, and then one, one more point about the ARDS and fluids. Remember, not all these patients are ARDS. Part of them. The, the other part may actually be dehydrated, and if we uh, if we keep them dehydrated more and volume uh, is low, that might contribute to their renal failure as well. So we have to be careful and obviously use our clinical judgment. Um, but I agree, heparin has not been an issue with volume in general. Okay. Uh, the continuation on that comment was that it was a patient that was over 500 pounds, 550 pounds, and so the, the dosing was higher, 72 cc's per hour, 1.7 liters per day, so that was adding that in addition to tube feeds. So I think that's where that volume was coming from. Um, another question was in here regarding, uh, for Dr. Hamada, ECMO experience is interesting, a drug used in Japan for pancreatitis to prevent coag in hemodialysis is being investigated in COVID-19. Nafamastat, anything to comment on that? I have no idea. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, what's the Thank name of the, the drug comment. again? Sorry, what's the name of the drug? Nafa. Naf Naf yes. Naf 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 yeah, Nafamastat. Yeah, we, we didn't hear it. N-A-F-A-M-O-S-T-A-T. No, I, I, we didn't hear about this drug. No idea. So another question to the panelists uh, I have, do you guys have experience with thrombolytics in any of the acute strokes or acute demise, uh, hemorrhagic uh, um, uh, complication? Um, uh, have you any used it in any of these patients? We did. I'll let Dr. Kerala start. I'm sure he probably did use it. We, we just used uh, TPA on one patient with uh, pulmonary embolism who was hemodynamically unstable. Mm -hmm. So that would actually be the same thing, whether it's COVID or non-COVID. So we did not use specifically uh, TPA for the COVID indication uh, if the patient is not hemodynamically unstable. Right. That's, that's also our experience. So I'm gonna branch this into two components. Component number one is like what Dr. Kerala alluded to, massive PE with hemodynamic instability. We had one case that at least I was involved in, in and we used TPA on that patient and then he, he did well after. Um, 
And then another question I got from cardiology, which was more like theoretical question. So I personally did not see a patient. That doesn't mean patient didn't present our ER with that uh, problem. So those patients with active COVID that have um, ST elevation MI, are, should we do an intervention on these patients or should we give them TPA? So obviously this has two components. If the patient uh, is just there, happened to be in a COVID ER and they may or may not have COVID, obviously, you know, you probably cannot activate your cath lab that fast or get them to do this procedure on a COVID patient. So um, we're giving TPA to these people. And my advice to the cardiologist at the time, again, no evidence-based medicine here, just clinical judgment. If the patient has active COVID and they have uh, uh, features of uh, ST elevation MI, we're recommending actually heparin drip, then a pause for uh, TPA, then back on heparin drip. We, we have used uh, TPA, just the low dose, the catheter directed TPA for a patient with large PE who, who went to ECOS. But the, same mission, the same patient I mentioned in the slide before, uh, he went to ECOS and uh, had the directed um, TPA. Yeah, we have used the same in our uh, uh, ICU and ER. We've had several patients with submassive PE, and they actually uh, qualified for ECOS, and they did receive ECOS. And we were not lucky enough in my institution to bring the cardiologists during COVID crisis. <laughs> well, I mean, they were on a standby only. Yeah, what we do actually, all, all admissions. All procedures, I'm sure you, they do the same thing. They get a rapid test and the test comes back within an hour. So there's no excuse for the cardiologist. You can do the, uh, the rapid test and within an hour, if they're negative, they can do the intervention. All right. All right. There is um, one more follow-up question about uh, using aspirin in that same VTE, that original question about the VTE and atrial clot patient, would you use aspirin as well? And I think we'll end on this question. What did you do, uh, Dr. Atassi? All right, would uh, my patient uh, yeah. question? Mm -hmm. the, uh, the patient with the uh, high D-dimer? And that had arterial clot. Yes, with the arterial clot. Yeah, so a patient actually is still hospitalized in the, uh, he went to surgery, he went to galactomy and uh, revascularization, and he's currently on heparin drip. And the plan is to, uh, we're testing his lupus, anticoagulant came back positive. And now we're doing testing for the anti phospholipid antibody, antibodies. Uh, and the plan, once he gets discharged, switch him to, to Coumadin if his anti phospholipid antibody are positive. If not, we continue uh, long-term anticoagulation with one of the NOACs. Right, and, and the question was about aspirin. Would you add aspirin to all of the above? Uh, well, arterial, arterial uh, blood clots, I may add aspirin too, yes. Yeah, that's, that's one of our criterion too, to add aspirin if they have arterial thrombosis. But you brought up actually a very important point about uh, the failure of NOACs to beat Coumadin or Warfarin in clinical trials and antiphospholipid syndrome. I just want to make sure that and again, this is for the future to studies to explore, to distinguish between this acquired antiphospholipid syndrome by COVID and the true antiphospholipid syndrome that we have in our body. Um, the difference here is maybe it's triggered by the virus and maybe it's only influential when the virus is in the system. So maybe DOEX are not necessarily inferior to warfarin in this setting. But again, you know, that's a personal bias of mine. Obviously my APS patients treated with warfarin, but just for COVID sake, um, I'm sticking with Dolex for everyone. If they have APS positive antibodies, I add aspirin. But you know, doing warfarin, no problem. You know, especially if you prove that they have thrombosis, for sure, it's one of the options. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. With that, that is our last question. Thanks, everybody, for your participation. Uh, big thank you to the panelists. Uh, for everybody for joining and everybody have a great evening.